Okay, so now I've reached a point where it's time for us to talk more specifically about carbon. So uh, when talking about bond formation previously, I mentioned that since carbon has six protons uh, in its nucleus, that means that it's going to have six electrons, right? Um, so what that's going to mean is that if here's our nucleus, uh, we're going to have uh, two electrons in the innermost orbital, and then that's going to leave us with four unpaired electrons in the outermost orbital, okay? Uh, and uh, so in the valence shell. So what that means is that this carbon has the potential to bond with up to four other atoms. And this is where we're going to have to seize on our inner five-year-olds because although I can draw this all on this whiteboard, it's a lot easier to understand what's going on with carbon if instead of working uh, with this two-dimensional plane, we instead work with some three-dimensional models. And so I had to hunt around, but eventually I found a stash of modeling clay um, and I found these red plastic toothpicks here in the biology department. Um, so that's what we're going to use. Um, so what you see here is our carbon atoms nucleus, and then um, the spots where the four red toothpicks stick out represent the four places where carbon would really like to have electron pairs instead of just lonely electrons. Um, one thing that you might notice uh, is that these four red toothpicks are positioned in such a way that they're as far apart from each other as possible because these electron pairs that are going to be around this carbon are all negatively charged and so they all repel each other. So the simplest case again would be to just pop four hydrogens onto the ends. Like so. Um, and then we wind up with the molecule that is uh, CH4. also known as methane. Okay, but things are gonna to start to get much more interesting when we start to think about combining carbons together with each other. Okay, so um, one thing we could do with these multiple carbons is to combine them together in a chain. Easier said than done sometimes. Okay, and um, in this case, I'm not gonna add all the hydrogens onto the other ends that are bare here. Um, so hopefully you can just imagine that they're there. Any place where there's not uh, anything uh, connected uh, through to these carbons, okay? Um, so that just implies that there's a carbon present. Um, okay, so um, uh, what we can wind up having, which you can see here, is uh, we can wind up having the formation of a chain of carbons, right? So if I'm gonna just draw this on uh, the whiteboard here, here's my chain of four carbons, and then we can imagine, so here's the hydrogens also hanging off of this. Okay, and um, for carbon chains, uh, chains can vary in a couple of different ways. So, for example, they can vary in how long they are or in uh, length, right? Um, so if there's just two carbons together, so that's going to be uh, C2H6, um, then that uh, results in the molecule ethane. Right, so drawing out the structure more formally, Right, so there's ethane. Um, and then uh, in comparison, if we have three carbons, so that's uh, C3, and then that's gonna be uh, H8, um, that's going to result in propane. Right, so then just imagine my hydrogens hanging off of here, okay. Um, and then uh, if there are four carbons, uh, that is then referred to as butane. 
Right, and that's what I drew up here and what we've got here in the modeling clay. Okay, so um, when I put this butane together, um, I also want you to notice something else. Um, I could just put these carbons in a straight line, which is what I've done here. I mean, you know, there's a, a bit of wiggle to it, but uh, not a ton. And um, so that's what's referred to as a straight chain carbon. Uh, molecule. Or um, there's another possibility here, um, which is that I could have, oops, I could have three carbons in a row and a branch point as well. Um, and so suddenly um, there's a lot more possibilities that you can imagine from here. And um, you know this universe of possibilities is just going to keep on expanding. Um, so uh, for another example, it's actually possible to form a ring of carbons. So they can vary in length. Uh, they can vary in branching. So here we've got... Uh, that's another example. Um, and uh, they can also form rings. So a very common configuration for rings is a ring with uh, six members in it. And one, two, three, five, six. Okay, six members in it. Um, so rings is another possibility here. Um, and uh, this uh, molecule that I've shown here is a molecule that's known as cyclohexane. Okay, so um, Next, in the overview video, I talked a little more about another possibility, um, which is that uh, two carbon atoms could also share more than just a single pair of electrons. So, for example, if they share two pairs of electrons, oh, okay, here's where the modeling clay is slightly less than ideal, right? So that's gone. Now they're sharing two pairs of electrons. So we've got one, two, three, four pairs uh, for the uh, carbon here, and we've got four uh, pairs on the carbon that's in the central and the center there. So uh, now uh, what we've got here is a double bond. Um, so it looks like so. So um, you know, for example, if I'm going to write this structure out, um, so it's going to be got single bonds and then I've got a double bond uh, in there as well. Okay, um, but there's another thing that I really want you to notice here. Um, so once these two carbons are sharing two sets of electrons, two pairs of electrons in the double bond, we actually go from a situation where each carbon atom has been able to spin freely relative to its neighboring carbon uh, to a situation where these carbon atoms can no longer spin freely. They're fixed in place in a rigid arrangement. And um, that winds up being a fairly important um, uh, property in terms of overall molecular structure and function. Um, and, uh, and again, I just want to emphasize that uh, because of the way these um, electron orbitals are oriented around the molecule, um, even you know a so-called straight chain carbon up here um, isn't actually straight. It's actually kind of uh, and it has a kinked arrangement. So um, these characteristics uh, actually lead to um, another uh, set of possibilities for variation in shape. So depending on where this couple, uh, carbon uh, double bond forms between neighboring carbons, um, and I'm going to actually I'm going to move this other uh, carbon atom up. So I have a straight chain carbon again. Um, so uh, depending on where um, and how this double bond forms here, the outcome could be that carbons one and four, um, so here's carbon number one, two, three, four. Um, so carbons one and four um, could wind up pointing in opposite directions off of these doubly bonded carbons. Um, however, uh, it could also be that, um, let's say this, that uh, last carbon wasn't uh, in the prior position, and instead it's in this position. Um, so you know it just depends on how this double bond forms, right? If I break this, I could flip this around, but when it's here, it's rigid. So it's going to fix this on um, the uh, carbons one and four uh, in an orientation relative to each other. So um, 
uh, here if they're pointing in, uh, they could wind up pointing in the same direction or they could wind up pointing in opposite directions um, off of those. So um, notice that in those two cases, and um, here I'll just draw this on uh, the whiteboard as well here. So um, we could have, so we've got two doubly bonded carbons and it could be that the neighbors, so here's carbon one, two, three, and four, so that carbons one and four are on the opposite sides. Or it could be that those two carbons wind up on the same side uh, as each other. Uh, so um, in both of these cases, we've got the exact same number of atoms. We just have a different configuration for them. And so these two molecules here are referred to as isomers. Uh, of each other. So they have the same molecular formula, um, but they have different structures and properties. And uh, this is really, it's not a trivial point. Um, and there can actually be three different types of isomers for us to consider. So um, what we have over here, um, where things vary in branching patterns, um, you know, that's an example of a uh, structural isomer. Um, so uh, we can have structural isomers that vary in branching patterns. Um, what we have here are referred to as cis trans isomers. Um, and so uh, the word cis means same, as indicated here. And then trans means opposite or across, uh, as indicated up here. Okay. Um, and then there's uh, one last example of um, another type of isomer that I want to mention here. But uh, this one may give you a slight headache, so don't dwell on it too much but mostly just be aware that uh, it can exist. And so this uh, third type of isomer um, is referred to as um, an enantiomer. And this is uh, what can happen if you have a carbon atom and you have uh, four different things attached to that carbon atom. So let's say there's another carbon here. There's some other type of group here. I'm just gonna symbolize that R. And then I have to imagine this in three dimensions. Um, so maybe there's another group back here. I'm going to call that R prime. And then the fourth group up here is R double prime. Um, so we can contrast that with um, if we have another uh, molecule here. So it's got a carbon. And then in this case, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put R double prime here, R here, and then in the back is R prime. And so what I've got here are two molecules that are mirror, oops, mirror images of each other. Um, and so uh, these mirror image molecules, um, if you create them in three dimensions, you'll discover that you cannot get them to line up with each other. And so um, this uh, type of variation, these are referred to as enantiomers. And they're said to differ in their handedness. Okay. Um, also, I'm going to give you a set of lecture slides that summarize what I've just shown you here. Um, and so I'm now going to wrap up this part of our biochemistry overview by talking about um, one other topic that's going to be beneficial as we head into our next section. So um, most of what I've been showing you here so far is focused just on two atoms for the most part, right? Carbon and hydrogen. And uh, remember, so carbon doesn't have an especially powerful degree of electronegativity. So the molecules that I've been showing you here so far 
are all molecules that are nonpolar, so they have no partial charges. But um, along with the variation in carbon configurations I've been showing you, there's also a handful of other atom combinations that are going to reappear over and over again in the polymers and larger molecules that we're going to examine next. Um, so I want to take a minute to introduce you to these other atom combinations and talk for a moment about them. You'll also find that it's very useful to have a good working knowledge of these combinations, or as they're called, um, of these functional groups. Ah, time for a new marker. Much better. Okay. Um, so for drawing these out, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to again use that uh, generic letter R uh, to symbolize other stuff that's connected to a given functional group. You know, often um, a carbon and then some other stuff. Okay, um, so uh, one motif that's going to appear over and over again is that of an oxygen atom bonded to something. And so hopefully you can remember that oxygen is missing two electrons in its valence shell, so it typically wants to bond to two other things. Plus it also has a fairly high electronegativity. So in one configuration, that oxygen will bind to some kind of R group, um, and then uh, it will, uh, at its other end, it's going to bond to a hydrogen atom. And uh, the end result of this is what's called a hydroxyl group. So I like to think of, it has ox in it for oxygen, okay? Um, and because oxygen has that electronegative attitude, uh, these hydroxyl groups are polar. So they have a partial charge, just like water has a partial charge. And we can contrast this with another functional group, which I'll draw right here, which is going to be a carbon bonded to you know, some kind of R group, and then bonded um, uh, to uh, hydrogen atoms at the other three positions. Okay, uh, so this looks very similar to the molecule that we actually started out with. And this functional group is actually referred to as a methyl group, okay? And um, based on what you know, uh, I want you to see what you think. Um, is this methyl group going to be polar or nonpolar and why? Okay, so um, that's our first two functional groups. Our third functional group is going to look a bit more exotic and um, that involves a carbon that is bonded to two other uh, jobbies of some sort or another. So we're going to call those R and R prime, okay? And um, then it's also going to be double bonded to an oxygen. Um, so this arrangement is definitely polar, uh, thanks to the oxygen, and it's referred to as a carbonyl group. or sometimes I hear people call it a carbonyl group. Um, okay, so now if you look at what we have here so far, you might discover that it's actually possible to combine two of these functional groups together to get a fourth type of functional group. So um, how about if we have um, you know, this carbon atom here, and then we've got an R group, um, and then that carbon atom is double bonded to an oxygen, here, and it's also single bonded to a hydroxyl group. And I'm just going to write the O and the H next to each other here, okay? Um, so this is then given a name that is a portmanteau of the words carbonyl and hydroxyl. So this arrangement is referred to as a carboxyl group. Okay. Um, and this functional group is definitely polar. Uh, is not only that, but it's polar to a point where this hydrogen out here is just barely hanging on. And so if this functional group is dipped in water, um, uh, this hydrogen atom will pop off and float away. Uh, so we're going to say this hydrogen will dissociate in water. Uh, and so uh, because the carboxyl group can release um, a hydrogen atom into solution, it's considered to be 
acidic. Okay, so um, now our next three functional groups are going to involve a couple of the other elements that I mentioned way back in the beginning um, of this whole series. And uh, those are the other three most common elements that are found in living things, right? So that would be um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So if we go back to those electron distribution diagrams, uh, what you'll discover is that nitrogen has three unpaired electrons in its valence shell. So it can form up to three bonds. So if it is in a configuration where it is bonded to some sort of R group, and that's you know usually going to be some collection of hydrogens, um, or, or sorry, of carbons, um, and that it is also bonded to two hydrogens, then uh, that forms uh, what's referred to as an amino group. Okay, and um, along with this, uh, thanks to this last set of paired electrons up here. Um, this amino group is naturally negatively charged. And so this amino group can also attract in a rogue hydrogen atom. Um, and then we'll wind up with a configuration um, of NH3+. And so the ability to pull in this hydrogen atom means that amino groups are considered to be basic. Okay. So um, the next one I'm going to draw is going to look pretty exotic right now. Um, and that's what happens with phosphorus. Um, so to kick things off for phosphorus, uh, what we need to do is draw out a full valence diagram for phosphorus. So phosphorus has 15 protons. And so it's going to have 15 electrons to balance out those 15 protons. So if we're going to draw out the full uh, valence um, uh, orbital diagram. So the innermost orbital has two electrons. Then after that, we've got eight electrons in the next orbital. So 10. So then we have five more electrons for the outermost orbital. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And then let's simplify this back down and we'll just look at the outermost um, orbital around this phosphorus. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So um, the fact that we're looking at three orbitals and with unpaired electrons in the outermost orbital, um, what that all means is that phosphorus has fairly low electronegativity. Uh, and in fact, if you go back and look, its electronegativity is 2.19. Um, which is even lower than hydrogen's electronegativity, which is at 2.20. Okay, so what that means is this phosphorus here would really love some buddies, but it's really not that great at holding on to its electrons. So that actually sets up perfect conditions for oxygen. And so here is what oxygen does. So we wind up with three oxygens that are all single bonded to this phosphorus. Okay. And then we also wind up with an oxygen that comes along and it helps itself to this pair of electrons. So it's going to form a double bond with this phosphorus. Thanks, oxygen. Okay. And along with that, um, two of these oxygens are going to form hydroxyl groups. Just draw those like so. And then this last oxygen is then what's going to form an attachment point to the rest of whatever molecule we're looking at, so to our R group. Okay, so this whole enchilada is referred to as a phosphate group. And these phosphate groups are charged. And um, they can ionize and release one of these hydrogen atoms into solution.
Um, so they're also considered to be acidic. Okay, um, so this phosphate group is obviously quite a bit to look at and think about. Um, so thankfully, our last group or our last contestant in the functional groups is a lot simpler, and that is sulfur. So if you go back and look at the periodic table, um, you're going to discover that sulfur is actually a next door neighbor to phosphorus. So sulfur has 16 protons, and so it's going to have 16 electrons. And if you think back to what we saw for the valence shell for phosphorus, then if there's 16 electrons instead of 15 electrons, what that's going to mean is we've got two sets of paired electrons and then two sets of unpaired electrons in the valence shell. Um, and uh, now sulfur, so it is one to the right from phosphorus. You know, it's got one more proton present. Uh, so what that means is that sulfur is more electronegative than phosphorus is. So um, the cases where we're going to see sulfur show up is situations where sulfur has a single bond with hydrogen and then just another single bond with some other stuff, so our infamous R group here. And interestingly, this sulfur is just enough more electronegative than carbon that this business here is polar. And this functional group is overall referred to as a sulfhydryl group. All right, so with that, uh, we started to build up some more complex arrangements of carbon, and we've explored some of the major types of functional groups. And so up next, we're going to take a look at how these pieces fit together to form the polymers that are the building blocks for the majority of molecules that make up living organisms. And we'll have more on that for next week.